<laughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, homemade uh, crypto. Uh, so a bit about me, I'm on the Const West team. I think we should break the ABI in C++23. I like unsigned integers, sorry Arvid. And uh, Greta is right. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm an uh, independent contractor. I do uh, security code reviews. I like to fuzz all the things. Uh, I'm on Twitter and GitHub and that's my personal homepage. So, let me introduce you to the elephant in the room. Everyone says, don't make your own crypto. And uh, why do they say that? Uh, and it's because it's very easy to make a crypto that yourself can't break, but it's extremely difficult to make a crypto no one else can break, especially considering large resources and long periods of time. But crypto is fun, so I think we should revise this and say, don't trust your own crypto. Of course we should make crypto, crypto is fun. So here, here are two links. The first one is uh, someone who's m made their own crypto for their malware. And that was very good because then uh, people who got uh, that malware could recover because it was broken. So that was good. And the other link is a serious motivation to uh, why you shouldn't do your own crypto. So imagine you're uh, coding in some code base and you encounter this function. Maybe someone recognizes this. It's uh, from the Stanford page on uh, bit twiddling hacks. So it's, it uh, looks fast, right? It uh, counts the number of set bits, the number of one bits in the input. So uh, as good coders, uh, as Jonas said, we should have tests. So we are writing a unit test. So this feels good. Now we have unit tests. But are we really sure that all those bit shifts and stuff is correct? Hmm, don't think so. So, I think we should do exhaustive testing instead. It's just 32-bit input, that's just 4 billion. Let's test all of them. Should be quick. So, uh, you may notice that it's a do by loop, and that's because, instead of a for loop, that's because otherwise you can't get the last element. So, otherwise it wouldn't be exhaustive. So um, <coughs> we fill this with a call to the function we're testing, and then we need a reference. And I found this built-in pop count, which exists in uh, Clang and GCC, uh, which maps to some hardware instruction. Uh, and we just assert that the answer is correct. So let me switch to a demo now. Yeah, it worked. So uh, we'll see this a few times. Uh, the yellow box is the, represents the input space. And, uh, oh, so this is what it looks like when you're doing this uh, do while loop. We'll just do a sequential run through everything. And if you look at the bottom here, we have y, the number of covered elements, compared to m, the total number of uh, possible inputs. So you can see it grow while I press this. We, you will have to look at that later. So it's a, as expected, we reach 100% after M steps. Nice. <clears throat> so a bit about exploration. What if there's a, a bug that is only exposed if you have a, a one in the uh, most significant bit? We will have to wait until uh, at least 50% of the a sequence before we find it. So wouldn't it be better to have better exploration and just jump around a bit in the input space? Um, I think so. So let's introduce an XOR. So it's the same thing as before, but we now have a, a variable with random bits in it. And then we flip the counter. Ah, I can't double click. Oh, doesn't double click work? Oh, damn it. Well, we flip it. Uh, and uh, if we loop over all possible 32 bit inputs uh, and instead loop over the XOR of all 32 bit inputs, we get the same 
uh, same set of values. So this will cover everything. So if we do this, it will look like this. Oh, come on. So uh, it covers the input space, and it looks like kind of semi-random. I'll do it once again, get some other seed. So this exploration is better, but it's for not that good. So why don't we use uh, random instead? So I had the uh, uh, Mersenne Twister random number generator from uh, the standard library here. Oops, and uh, we just have an infinite loop and generate numbers on the fly until we're done. So if you know, now pay attention to the bottom graph, you can see when we traverse the input space, uh, we get red for those who are, uh, which are hit uh, more than one time. So it will, we won't reach 100%, it will go slower and slower and slower because we keep hitting input that we already covered. So this is not any good. So we got good exploration from using random. And the only way to beat it is to use tricks from fuzzing. So if you haven't heard about fuzzing, I talked about that last year. So we can look at that video if you are interested. But let's uh, analyze the wasted effort a bit. <clears throat> so if I have m possible inputs, so that will be 2 to the 32 in this example, and we have k test cases, we get y distinct inputs. Uh, y is now a stochastic variable because we're using random. So what we get is a variant of the birthday problem, perhaps you heard, or the birthday paradox. So the birthday paradox is about if you have a, a group of kids, a school class, and you ask, uh, what's the probability of um, two people or more sharing the same birthday? And the paradox is that it's, uh, it's very high compared to what you th spontaneously think. So the birthday problems, there's 365 days, 30 students perhaps, and we ask about the probability of collision. And for our case, we have two to the 32 inputs, we k tries, but we ask about what's the expected number of distinct inputs, like the valuable number of tries we did. So if you do the math, this is the expected value. So because y is a random variable, we can only reason about the statistical properties. Uh, so this is what it would be on average if you repeat the experiment and average out. So if, if k is large, we can approximate with this. So this is uh, uh, the expected value of y over m. It will slowly converge to 1 as uh, we go to an infinite number, number of tries. So this is what it looks like if you plot it. So the blue line is uh, sequential. So you reach 100% and then you're done. But the random one just keeps going and going, and we're never done. So if you compare that to the experimental curve here in the JavaScript simulation, um, you can see it looks pretty similar. So if we take this curve and flip it around, we can instead ask if we want the desired num uh, amount of coverage, how many tries do we have to uh, do? And that can be translated to this. So this is the waste in percent as a function of the wanted coverage. So if we are in the beginning, all new samples will just be all over the place and we won't have any waste. But the further you go, the more waste you have. And when you want to reach 100% coverage, the overhead will go to infinity. So this is bad. The good thing is that we now have uh, random sampling, which is, covers the input very well. Uh, we have uh, a lot of wasted effort, and we know that this method is inefficient. There must be something else we can do. Could we get the random order, because that's what we are out after, without the repetition? 
and there's std shuffle. So uh, we can first generate all the possible inputs in an array or vector. We permute it and then we use it. So we can be fancy and use Yoda to, or Iota uh, to uh, populate the array. And then we uh, get ourselves a random number generator and invoke shuffle with it. And then we just iterate over the vector. So if we do this, oops. Uh, it's gonna look like this. So we cover everything very well with the random exploration and we get from zero to 100% without any waste. Wow, perfect, we're done. Except this is C++ and we care about performance. So uh, uh, I did some tests using perf and Debian Linux uh, I removed the function we are testing and replaced it with an empty function. So we don't test the scaffolding, not the bit count thing. I had to put it in another translation unit because otherwise the compiler will just see it's an empty function. I'll optimize your entire program to nothing. So uh, I want to prevent that. I ran this on a pretty recent uh, Intel CPU and I count the CPU cycles, not time, because uh, modern CPUs just jump around with the frequency and uh, they have turbo and whatnot. So that, this gives very stable results. So the fastest one is the sequential iteration. It takes four uh, cycles for one sample. Uh, perhaps this is surprising to you that it takes as much as four samples for just a for loop, but there is a function call in there. And uh, I think that uh, besides uh, being a function call, I think that prevents the compiler from doing or and the CPU from doing things which are normally fast. If you can inline your target into the scaffolding, it will probably be faster. So if we add the XOR, there's one more cycle. So it's a bit slower. If we take the std random, uh, we get 42 cycles. And this is actually the fastest one in the standard library. So there I took uh, a few and tested. This wasn't, was the fastest. So guess how fast std shuffle is. Do we have any guesses? Very slow is a very good guess. So it's two to 300 times worse. And a shout out to Bjorn, thank you for your uh, help analyzing this. We had an interesting exchange on how to implement this. Um, yeah, so those are the random ones I tested. So why is the shuffle so slow? Well, the first thing that happens with the std shuffle approach is that we uh, allocate a huge amount of memory for 32-bit input, we will have 16 gigabyte of RAM. Uh, and then we fill it with the sequence, and then we shuffle it. All this work is done upfront before we invoke our function on the test for the first time. So we have a lot of work before we actually get going. It has terrible cache behavior, because it will jump around in memory randomly. So you will have guaranteed have a cache miss every cycle when you shuffle it. So this was a rabbit hole so, which I fell into, so if you want to read more about it. I worked a bit with it doing a lazy fisher jades that was really interesting, but uh, yeah, I won't talk about it more today. So we want random exploration, we want no repetitions, we, won't, we don't want those 16 gigabytes of memory allocated we don't want to make up the work up front. We just want to do the work while we iterate. <coughs> and we want to be as fast as random. So how can we do this? Enter block cipher. Uh, the, that's a crypto building block. So a block cipher can be used for a number of purposes. Uh, you can build a hash. You can build, encrypt your hard drive. You can... Um, protect 
network traffic. So it's a building block. Works like this. Uh, you have a block of data on the left with n bits of clear text. And then you encrypt it, and you get n bits of crypto text. So it's very important that the size of the input and the output is equal. So that's why it's called a block cipher. It's a block of data. So if you decrypt it, you just go in the opposite direction, and you need the secret key. If you can decrypt it without the secret key, I would say it's a lousy block cipher. So for an example, I'll show you how to do this with three bits of data. That's what fits on the slide. So if you take a look on the left, that's the possible, all possible three bit inputs. Um, the, I just made this up by hand, by the way. There's no algorithm involved here. Uh, the right hand column is the output. So this block cipher, it's just a lookup table. It's a special case of a lookup table. Uh, the size of this is uh, two to the uh, two to the n, so uh, it will g be huge. If you have a 128-bit cipher, it will be 2 to the 128 long. So it, you can't store this. All those uh, crypto algorithms, they calculate this dynamically. So only for toy examples is it possible to store it. So the important property of the block cipher is that uh, uh, it's size preserving. So the size of the input is equal to the size of the output. The other property is that it's distinct. If you have two different inputs, they will decrypt to different values. And uh, otherwise, you wouldn't get your files back on your hard drive. So this is an important property. <coughs> so all this means that a block cipher is a permutation so not only is it a lookup table, it's a permutation. So if we go back to the example, you can see that the right-hand column is a permutation of the left one. So all the values we have on the left exist in the, on the right. So now we have an outline for a solution here. We have our block crypto, or block cipher. And then we have a loop counter. And the, but instead of invoking f with a loop counter, we will encrypt it first and uh, invoke it. So this will reach all possible values. And if it's a good cipher, this will appear like a random order. So, nice. Let's see where we can find a block cipher. These are some well-known ones. The AES uh, is the most well-known. That's probably what you're using on your hard drive right now or your iPhone. But you can see it's 128 bits, 64 bits. The last one is 32 bits as well. So they are fixed bit sizes. So that's our first problem. Uh, we will need, uh, if we were to test a function which takes an integer and a bool, we would need a 33 bit input. And uh, we didn't have that. The second problem is speed. All those uh, existing ciphers are uh, optimized for security uh, or a given number level of security, and that costs performance. And we don't want to pay for that because we don't need it. So where do we find a fast n-bit block cipher with n arbitrary? We'll make our own. So we're going to use something called a Feistel structure. And this is a great invention. It's a really simple recipe for making a block cipher out of thin air. And it's not a toy. It's actually a real algorithm that works fine, even if it's simple. So we'll start with something called a rounding function, which we have to provide. So if we have a n-bit block cipher, 32-bit in example, it will have to accept the half the bit width, so it takes a 16-bit input and returns a 16-bit output. And it takes the key, that's the secret we are encrypting with. And as long as we have this, we can make a block cipher. So what does the rounding function do? Well, it essentially just wreaks havoc with the input. It will mix the bytes, it will flip them, rearrange them, combine them, do everything it can to just shuffle things around. 
And here's the Feistel structure. They can have a look at the picture on the left. You start with the uh, plain text at top, and uh, we split it in left and right. We take the right, feed it into our rounding function using the secret key for that round, and then we XOR the result of that with left, and then we just swap left and right and do it again. And uh, we'll do it for a couple of times. A normal number is between 10 and 20. So this is really easy. <coughs> this is what it looks like. So we, this is a 32-bit doc cipher. So we just uh, split the input here, shift it, and uh, mask it, and just apply the rounding function. Here is the XOR you're looking for. Oops. Yeah. And when we're done, we will just uh, concatenate left and right together and form the uh, encrypted text. I chose a rounding function here as just an XOR with the key and then times an arbitrary contestant, 35. This is probably a lousy round, uh, rounding function. But we'll talk a bit more about that. So how do we generalize this 32-bit example to n bits? We'll have to pick integer types that can hold n bits and n bits half for the intermediate values. And if we do this for a 24-bit example, um, the only thing different from before is that we have 12 here. Uh, 12 instead of 16. We have a mask with the 12 bits in it. And when we are done with the uh, rounding function, we'll just apply the mask before we pass it on. So that's easy. And we shift with 12 bits instead of 16 at the end. So that's it. This is a real cipher. It's probably poor quality, but it's a real block cipher. So what do we do if n is odd? It's difficult to split it in left and right. Well, the only thing is that you have to keep the sizes different from left and right. And it's not difficult. It's just tedious to do. I haven't done it. Uh, but you have to do it. So this structure looks like a gen generic implementation would be possible. So I made one, I templated it on the integer types. I used the curiously recurring template pattern, CRTP, to, so we don't have any uh, virtual function calls in the hot path. And uh, the only purpose of the derived class is to provide the rounding function. That's the customization point. And the number of rounds, because that's a uh, tuning variable. So this is what the base class looks like. It's uh, C uh, CRTP, so it knows the derived type. And uh, you can see that the encrypt and decrypt function both redirect to a common function, because those are very similar for a Feistel cipher. And then we just uh, pre-compute some values to the mask to uh, avoid having to do it in the hot loop. This is what the common encryption and decryption function looks like. It's exactly as before, but I have replaced the 32-bit ones with the templated type. And we have a check here for if we are encrypting or decrypting. If we are encrypting, we count the rounds from 0 and up. If we are decrypting, we count the rounds from the uh, max and down. And that's it. That's a generic Feistel function. And this is how you're going to use it. So apart from the initialization of the secret key, this is actually uh, a complete cipher. That's, this is the only thing we have to write. So we only have to provide the rounding function. You can see in this rounding function, I have chosen a hash fnv1a, and we will talk a bit more about that in a minute. But this is how you make a custom cipher. 
it's not more difficult than that. <coughs> so how do you choose the rounding function? Uh, we want it to be fast. We want it to mix the key and the input well. And we want something called a bit avalanche. So if you flip a bit in the input, you want uh, the, all the output bits to flip with 50% probability. So you don't want, want any pattern. You just want everything to just uh, flip around as much as possible without any structure. So I searched for a fast hash function, which uh, has these properties. And I find this one. I think it's called uh, foulnolvu hash. I don't remember right now. Um, it makes an XOR and a multiplication for each input byte. So that sounds pretty fast. And it exists for 32 bits, 64 bits uh, internal sizes. Notably, there is no 16 bit version which we need. So uh, if you ask the authors, you should uh, build the 16 bit version by XORing the two halves of the 32 bit version. So that's the correct thing to do, but that adds two instructions. So we don't want to do that. We want to cheat. So we'll just truncate it. Oh, that's another talk. Yeah. Uh, so how expensive is this? So this is a pretty good giveaway with a blank space. So uh, we get 10 CPU cycles for the truncated one and 12.4 if you do the correct hash. So it's faster than random, and faster than stood random, but could we do better? Perhaps a faster hash, or we could use SIMD, and I've been down to these rabbit holes, but uh, I won't have time to talk about it today. Um, I've been down that rabbit hole as well, and I eventually settled for this. If you haven't seen this Intel Intrinsics guide, I recommend you have a look. It shows you what you can do with the hardware. So I settled for this. This is uh, modern CPUs have a hardware accelerated AES encryption. So it does uh, 20 rounds of uh, this function. So I just pick one round and uh, uh, this will flip the bits uh, using the key. So hopefully this should be faster. And it is, so I save the CPU cycle. <clears throat> so this is the cost. We can do random iteration instead of sequential at the cost of five uh, CPU cycles extra per cycle. Yes? Oh, sorry. It, uh, I think that would turn the, everything in favor to uh, the sequential version. So if you actually, I measured having two function calls. So instead of four, I think it's like uh, uh, seven. Uh, so I guess if you extrapolate that, it's, it's doing one loop per cycle. So uh, these num numbers, uh, yeah. So if you can inline, it's, it gets better. Mm, yeah, so random iteration. Say you have a, a sequence, first, last, which you want to do for each on. Um, you have m elements and not necessarily a power of two. So we are lost because we are working with powers of two. So what you do then is you take the uh, two logarithm and round it up and if you get the result above M you just throw it away and take the next one. So this will waste at most 50%. So this is, uh, uh, this is a working implementation. So just measure the distance, take the logarithm and then if it's less than 32 bits needed I just reuse my 32 bit cipher and if it's more than 32, I'll use the 64-bit version. 
as you can see that I, I checked that we are, uh, we throw away the values that are above them. Otherwise we'll just invoke the callback on this uh, iterator. So that's it. So um, here's a link to the talks if you talk, if you're interested. And uh, that's all I had to say. So Rasmus. Does the round function have, have to be one to one? Uh, no, the rounding function, uh, the question was, uh, does the rounding function be one to one? No, the rounding function can be anything. It can return zero. It will be a really lousy cipher, but it will still work. And that's the beauty of the Feister structure. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the picture. So the, the nice thing with this structure is anything you put in F, anything, any round function will do. It's guaranteed to be a working cipher. So that makes it a lot easier. You can just do whatever you want. I played around with CRC32 because there's hardware support for it. I played around with the crypto support, um, bit deposit uh, functions. Um, yeah, e everything can just go wild. Yeah. yeah maybe I missed something. Where do we get all the keys from? You have a series of keys. Doesn't matter really. I just pick it from uh, stood uh, random device. Um, because we don't, we never, I don't know if you noticed, but we never decrypted. Yeah. So perhaps yeah. if. It, you can use the same key, but it's probably going to be a bad result. So um, I just fill it with random bits. And perhaps you want to store it somewhere. So in case you want to run your test once more in the same order. But uh, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Oh yeah, but uh, that's only what it appears to you. So you take that key, and then you, you from that key, you, you split it in several parts. You will iterate over it, and there's um, uh, sometimes you use a key whitening process. So if you have a bad key, it will be get a better key. Yeah, you divide the key. That's the key you have there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no. Okay. So, time for some uh, break then. Thank you.